Yeah. How's everyone this morning? Great. Lovely. Great. Great. Lovely, lovely day. A bit chilly for Brisbane. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of going home this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to sing your song to start with? No, I don't want to sing your song. Right. <laughs> I, I, I've got a terrible voice today, so I was really out of tune singing uh, earlier. So uh, I don't certainly want to do it and, and, and have 20 people feel my out of tune. <laughs> uh, yeah. What I wanted to do firstly is uh, just to talk a little about your emotional responses to what we talk about today. Because uh, that's really important. As you are all probably aware, how many of you have actually been to the Oneness University? Pretty much all of you. And how many of you did the 21 day? All right. And how many did the 7 day? 7 day. Okay. Okay. Those of you who did the 21 day, you'll realise how intense it was emotionally. Is that the case for those of you? We did the 21 day. For those of you who did the seven day, it was a little different uh, emotionally. So um, you may not have heard some of the things that, uh, that I'll discuss a little bit uh, later as we go through. But the reason why I wanted to ask those questions is because it's very important that you understand your own emotional responses to everything we discuss today. And it's very important that you take ownership of those emotional responses. So what I would like to do is just talk to you about um, some, of the, some of the emotions you may feel and, and, um, and then we can sort of discuss, if you like, um, how you go about actually owning these emotions within yourself. Now, you know at the Oneness University that there was a very much a focus on emotion. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is if you can't focus on your causal emotion, in other words, you can't access the basic underlying emotions that drive your actions, then what will happen is you also will not ever be fully connected with yourself. And you'll also not ever be fully connected with God. So that's a very important thing to understand too. The second thing I'd like to just briefly mention as well um, as I go through this discussion is how we connect with God. And how many of you have a viewpoint of God still that God is an energy? an energy force rather than an in entity. So in other words, how many of you have a sort of a general concept of God compared to how many of you feel that God is actually some kind of individual of some kind that you can connect with on a personal level? So those of you who feel that God's personal, can I just have a show there? So you mean personal as we connect personally, individually with him? And that God is an entity. Yes, okay. Uh, that God is an entity in his own right, like, yeah, that exists without your existence. Yeah. And how many of you feel that God is different to that? Yeah? Okay, so a few of you. Okay. So that gives me some idea of, of where, where we're at in terms of, um, in terms of our feelings about God. Firstly, my feelings about God are that God is an entity and that I can have a personal relationship with God. Uh -huh. So all of the comments that I'm going to make today are all going to surround that basic premise. And if you are uncomfortable with that, then, then of course you're probably not going to be able to accept much of what I say today. Um, the second thing is to understand your own emotional condition, the key thing to understand, and this is one very basic thing to understand, is that every time you get into your intellect, and every time you feel any annoyance, frustration or anger, you are actually denying your own emotion at that point. You follow me? So during today, there would be some statements that I'm going to make that you're going to say, how can he know that? He doesn't know that, that's just his personal opinion. Well, yes, you may feel it is my personal opinion. I am giving you my time for free, which is very, very different than what has happened with you with the Oneness University, is it not? And I'm giving you my time for free. You do not have to accept anything I say to you at all. And if you, if you don't want to accept it, that's fine. I'm perfectly happy with that. I am here at Grant's loving invitation um, to, to do this. And one thing that I want to say up front is that if I do feel anger projections from you, I will first be addressing that. The second thing I'll do is I'll ask you to leave or I'll stop one of the two. Now, do you understand why that's the case? 
The reason why is because if I'm giving of my love to you and giving of my time and my energy and my effort to you, and you can't own your own emotions in that transaction, just like I need to own my own, then straight away there's resistance. And there's resistance in your heart of, for accepting. Now, as soon as there's resistance emotionally inside of me, there's also going to be resistance to anything I'm hearing. And all that I'm hearing will just pass through these emotional filters, these beliefs that I have already established within myself of what, how I believe the universe to be. And if that occurs, as, that, as those emotions pass through me, I'm going to filter out every single thing that's said to me, and I'm going to interpret as something completely different than what's actually being said in many cases. And that is a very damaging thing to do to yourself, but also in the projection of anger to somebody else, that then becomes a damaging thing to them as well. And so if I love myself, I can't allow that to continue, if that makes sense. You'll also notice that almost every time, those of you who spent particularly the 21-day oneness course, you'll notice that every time you got into anger, if you ever did, you were always usually brought <laughs> to it, it was brought to your attention. Uh, and that there was something deeper underneath that. And it's very important for you to understand that today as well. Now that being said, I don't think I'm going to say too many things that make you angry. I'm just saying, just let yourself feel those emotions. Just let yourself feel them. Today, there are lots of spirits who have come with you today. Fantastic. All right. Now, many of those spirits are oneness blessing spirit givers. And uh, they exist in different spheres of the spirit world from the fourth to the sixth sphere. And many of them have a lot of trouble with the things that I've been saying to them. I've been talking to them uh, privately um, on other occasions. In fact, at one stage I talked to nearly 2,000 of them at one point. And uh, they have a lot of difficulty with the things that I've been saying to them. Which also means then, because you're connected with them, that you're possibly going to have some difficulty of the things I'm going to say to you as well. Does that make sense? Because of that spirit influence. Now these, um, and I want to give some background about what's actually happening with the oneness movement in the spirit world. Because that's something that probably very few of you have ever been talked about or even uh, uh, thought of perhaps. And I want to talk about that because it's very much influencing what's occurring with the oneness movement here on Earth. And that being said, I feel the oneness movement has a lot of beautiful potential for major changes on the Earth. And it just is a matter of everyone in the oneness movement understanding what's actually going on and then utilising the divine laws of our Father in such a way that that all the truth becomes known to the people you're giving the blessing to. So that's very important, that truth, the whole truth, not just partial truth or limited truth, is actually told to each person, and particularly to yourselves as the persons giving the blessing. Now, whether you accept this as the truth or not, that is totally up to you. Um, and I can explain as many things as possible of what's going on, but you will need to personally experience them to know whether they are true or not in the end. It's like every truth that you will ever accept, you will only ever accept it once it becomes your personal experience. All right, so that all being said, let's just talk a little about uh, the oneness blessing itself and what's actually happening. Now, who of you have actually experienced the flow, like the golden ball, Thing happening to you where the golden ball actually enters you and you actually saw it enter you. Any of you actually see that happening? Because that has happened around the world in different locations. But none of you have personally had that experience? No? Okay. Uh, I've you? felt it. You've felt it? You've yes. felt that energy? No, no, I've actually not been externally. I've sat with it. Oh, you've sat, like, you've sat down and you could feel some, something next to you yeah, projecting love at you. Yeah. Yep. And how many of you have had that experience where you've, where you've felt the projection of love at you uh, from some thing or some entity? You're not sure what at this point. Okay. All right. what, what other experiences have you had individually, if I could just uh, have some comments? Giving the blessing. Uh, actually receiving it firstly for yourselves. Yeah. What, what experience have you had there? Um, well... 
One, many, many, but one that I can think of if you think we're talking energy, mm -hmm. um, where I felt the energy just flowed very, very powerfully through me. It came from my crown right through my body and my mm -hmm. whole body, it was like every cell in my body was tingling. Yep. And with it there came almost a sound, I can't, it's so hard to describe, it was like almost like crystal energy. Yeah. Ripping. And how did you feel after that? that wonderful. Pe very peaceful. Extraordinary. Oh, okay. Great, great peace. Yep. Okay. Anybody else like to mention what's happened with them? <coughs> how many of you feel a little? Uh, how, how many of you feel a little like none of these things happened to me? Like, what's going on? <laughs> how many feel like that? Okay. <laughs> no worries. And. What I would like to do is explain what actually goes on with the soul with reception of divine love first. And it's very important that you understand these, this truth of the reception of divine love. So remember, I constantly say to people that you are a soul, right? And by soul, remember yesterday what I referred to as the soul? Would you like me to put this a bit higher? Or yes. You would. You do that. I was going to sit down and be lazy, but I might have to stand up. <laughs> Now, when I say soul, I'm talking about your emotions and your feelings. So, remember they are to do with your emotions, your passions and desires and so forth. That's the real you. Not, not your intellect. <coughs> your mind is actually, remember I said yesterday, for those of you who were there, your mind is part of the spirit body. And the soul has its own mind, but the soul's mind is its emotions and desires and passions and longings. The soul is capable of thought, but not in the sense that we often consider thought to be at, in our current state. Um, would you define then the personality as having the amount of passion, the amount of desire? Is that what the personality is? Personality is also a part of the soul, yeah. yeah. Oh. And you could say the soul has thousands and thousands of characteristics and attributes. So, um, for instance, if I, if I pick up this chair and I say to you, well, you describe that chair to me. You will describe different attributes, won't you? Like, it has four legs. It has, you know, two padded cushions, one horizontal, one vertical. And you could describe that it's made of metal and, it's, and all of these different things, right? And they are all the characteristics and attributes of this particular chair. But that's different to the chairs that you're sitting on up the back. Because they're still chairs, but they are totally different in their characteristics and attributes. Does that make sense? And it's very much the same with how we look at everybody's individual soul. Everyone has these, we could define as these different things within each soul, but because of personality, they are all different in nature as well. Does that make sense to you? So, I'm having trouble with personality, what yeah. that actually means. Like, what does that, um, my personality is what? And, well, a lot of times it's very difficult in this current state on earth to actually describe personality to people because at the moment our personality is a mixture of errors as tr and, and truth. The errors are the emotional baggages that we've picked up, if you like, through our life from the moment of incarnation onwards. And the truth of our personality is what God put there before we actually incarnated. And the only time you will know what your true personality is, is once you've cleared away all of your error-based emotions, then you'll understand what your true personality actually is. And personality, if you could think of it, is all these parts of you that define you, who you are, that is unique to yourself and no one else, but also can be common to other people. So who here loves music? So fairly much all of us. Yeah. How many of you play a musical instrument? So, so even though most of you love music, there's only two that play musical instruments. So why is that? There's something going on personality-wise there, isn't there? 
But there's also some injury-based things going on there for some of you, isn't there? Where some of you don't feel that you can play music or you're not going to be good at it or I'm too late to learn now or all those kind of things, right? So how much of that is our pure personality and how much of that is our actually injuries? It's hard to tell at this point until we've cleared away all of our emotional baggage. But once you clear away all of your emotional baggage, you will become completely assured of what your own personality is. So, like, a part of my own personality I know is integrity. So I know that I'm like that, and it might be a part of your, in, of your personality that you are really aware of. You may have a part of your personality that's related to femininity, if you're, a, if you're a female, that you really connect with, and you really feel that's a big part of your personality. So there will be all these different things that are a part of your personality. And God made your pristine personality. And he made everyone's pristine personality, and he made us all different. So we're all going to be different with our personality. But many times errors into the soul as well, and we think that's a part of our personality, but really it's just the mud that's been thrown at us. Right? So how many people have read these <coughs> books that talk about you know, four or five definitions of what kind of personality you are? You know? And you know, choleric and... You know, or, and in reality, many times, what are they describing? They are describing your injuries, really. That's all they're really describing. And that's the problem with many of these books, is all they do is they're describing the injured human condition rather, the, rather than the pristine human condition. So I'm talking about this being your soul, and it's full of pristine things, and it's also full of injuries. Right? Here's God's soul. There is only one way for every single child of God to receive God's divine love. And that is by a direct connection between the soul of the person and God's soul. When you think about it, it makes sense, because why would God have a connection with one person that's special and not with other people? It wouldn't make any sense, would it? If you had, if you had five children, wouldn't you try, wouldn't you feel a feeling of love if you were in your pristine condition? Wouldn't you feel a feeling of love to all of those children equally? Mm -hmm. So why would God then create a heap of children that, that he can't connect to as much because he doesn't want to? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Even the best of human fathers would want to connect to all of his children. So why wouldn't God want to connect to all of his children? So each of you has the ability to connect with God directly. It's a very important one thing to understand. The way the connection occurs is through what they call the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a conduit. It's a cord, if you like, that connects you with God directly. No other being in the universe has the ability to connect you with God. No other being. Any sense, Adrian? Uh, can't a person be a conductor for God's love? Um, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can reflect the love of God that's in your soul to another person, mm -hmm. but you can't be a conductor for God's love. There is only one conductor for God's love, and that is this this conductor that God created, the Holy Spirit. Very Now, I know all of you have been told differently than that. All right? But I'm saying to you that every single one of you cannot give somebody else divine love. You must, you can receive it for yourself and you can help another person receive it for themselves but you cannot give it to them from you. Do you follow me? There's a big difference between those two states. You can assist a person, this soul, let's say this soul is a person you're giving the blessing to. You can assist this soul to open up emotionally and open up with their desires and passions and everything by giving them love from a spirit or your own love, which would cause them to open up their soul towards God, which then causes them to actually connect with God and long for God's love. You can do that. 
And that, that might happen even at the time of giving the blessing. That will, many times that will happen at the moment you're giving the blessing. So at the very moment you're giving the blessing, because the person who's receiving the blessing is receiving this intense amount of love from a spirit, and we'll talk about what love they're actually receiving in a minute, they're receiving this intense amount of love through you from a spirit, that will open up their soul, and in some cases, and this is why it happens with some people and not other people, in some cases what will happen is their soul will open up so much that they, want a, they feel a desire in their heart for this connection with God, and all of a sudden, God's divine love flows into them. And when God's love, divine love, flows into them, they will have quite amazing experience with that, generally. And that's why some have an amazing experience, and some have no experience at all. Do you follow me? Because some are not open emotionally inside, and even giving them love from another person doesn't trigger them to open themselves inside enough for God's divine love to flow into their soul. It's very important to understand that God wants this personal contact with you and God wants this personal contact with the person you're giving the blessing to. All right? He doesn't go through you to give his love to the person you're giving the blessing to. But your love for the person and the spirit who's with you giving the blessing through you, his love for the person, can open their soul enough for them to long for God's divine love to flow through them. So that's the mechanism that's actually occurring. Right? We'll describe, I'll describe in more detail the mechanism that's actually occurring at you know, and the spirit level and the soul level as we go on. But it's very important to understand that God wants to give each individual soul his love and no other being in the universe can give God's love to another being. Only God can give God's love to another being. Now, when you think about it, it also makes sense of your own love. The only person that you can give your love to another person is you. you. Do you understand that? No one else, I can't give your love to somebody, it can't flow through me. Remember, love is an emotion, therefore it's energy in motion. How can the energy, the energy has to, it would first flow to me, but then if I'm giving you the love, when I've received your love, me and I'm saying I'm giving you her love what's actually going on is that your love is affecting me my energy raises and so now when I give that love to you you can feel my more intense energy being given to you does that make sense? yeah because it's transformed and it's actually my love he, her love being transformed through me I'm now feeling more love and as a result of feeling more love I can now give more love to you and then you feel that love you follow me? So that's the actual thing that's going on in the terms of our transactions when I'm trying to refer love to somebody else. And this is exactly the same thing what happens with the spirit. And I'll talk about the one that's blessing itself and what's actually happening with the blessing itself. So there's God, our parent, there's our soul or anyone else's soul, all at the same level. We no, no one's greater than the other. We all have this direct connectability, if you like, this direct connection with God if we desire it. But this connection of the Holy Spirit depends on desire and truth. Right? Sometimes that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. In other words, if a person desires love, God's love, to flow into them at the soul level, not at the intellectual level, but remember it has to be at the emotional level, then God's love will flow through them as long as the person is also in truth in that moment. In other words, they are accepting all of their own emotional truth at that moment as well. And this is why the oneness blessing, you know, the university constantly is saying, focus on your emotion, focus on your emotion, get to the causal emotions, because it's the causal emotions that stop or prevent the flow of love, whether it's from a person or from God. And it's your causal emotions that prevent the flow of love flowing into you. And for every single person that you give the blessing to, the ones that you give the blessing to who are open to love will receive the blessing. The ones who are closed to love and are not living, don't have a desire for it or are not living in truth with it, even though they intellectually think they are, they will not receive the blessing. And that's why sometimes it seems to work and sometimes it doesn't work. Right? 
I can walk into a Pentecostal church saying I don't know God, right? Mm -hmm. And in a second, I'll be on my knees weeping yep. because of that experience. When I was at the university, I asked what the difference between the blessing and the Holy Spirit was, and they actually told me there was no difference. There's a big difference. And they never brought it up again. Mm -hmm. When I get the blessing, I don't have that experience mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And this is, uh, and this is something that's really important to understand. The, the, the experience of the Holy Spirit connection is going to be an overwhelming emotional experience. You will feel it. Mm -hmm. right? When you're not feeling it, you are actually feeling love from a different being, not from God. Right? And that is a different, a totally different energy and a totally different response inside of yourself. Right? Just earlier you were crying, right? You were experiencing right then the reception of divine love through the Holy Spirit. Right at that moment. Alright, so let's go a bit further. Is that alright so far? We're okay with that? Now, I know that's confronting. Grace, grace is an operation of divine love, which is, which is part of God's forgiveness and mercy. So, God's divine love has attributes and qualities of its own. And one of its attributes is mercy, and another attribute is forgiveness. So, grace is when... Uh, so, great, and, and um, I've got to chat... Uh, I've got a talk coming up soon, a, f a few months away, about divine love specifically and its characteristics and attributes. And I list about 20 characteristics and attributes of divine love. And one of them is grace, which is that aspect of forgiveness and mercy, where God actually... And this is to do with the law of compensation or the law of karma. So we, we can talk about that at another time because there's a whole discussion about that. But grace is a part of divine love, yes. So when a lot of religious forms now particularly Christian forms, are now talking about God's grace a lot. And they're really speaking about this aspect of divine love, which is merciful and forgiving. Mm. Well, then what is Kundalini? Uh, Kundalini is a totally different energy. And that's an, the end. The, God has, a, has many hundreds of different types of emotional energies flowing from her. And one of the emotional energies flowing from her is what's, what you would call the emotional energy of the sustenance of the universe. Right? So God has this energy flowing from her which sustains her universe, like a nurturing mother breastfeeds her child, if you like. Right? And that is Kundalini. That is the, the flow of energy that can keep you sustained. And, and God, that is available to everyone as well. And, uh, and most people, and, and in the end, you will all connect with that energy, whether you progress on the natural love path or the divine love path. So, what, what does it actually mean to be awoken, or Kundalini is awoken? Um, yeah, we were talking about this a few days ago, myself and Grant, about what enlightenment means, or what awakening means. Mm -hmm. And it means different things on the natural love path than it does on the divine love path. On the natural love path, which is what most people are referring to on the earth, it, they're talking about an intellectual awakening to, to their spirit form, into, into the metaphysical. And that's not the same as awakening at the soul level, the soul awakening that I speak about. The soul awakening occurs at the emotional level and not at the intellectual level. Now, to receive Kundalini, all you need to do is awaken at the material level or the, or the intellectual level. And that's why many spirits talk about its importance. And so therefore many people on earth who are spiritual, who are receiving information from spirits, talk about its importance. It's actually not the same energy as God's divine love. And God has many other types of energy that are not her divine love either. For instance, God has a creative energy. And one day you'll experience that where you will actually, whether you do it here or on the spirit world, you'll actually create a, an animal and ask God to infuse it with her creative energy and it will become alive. Right? Now that's a different type of energy as well. That's not God's love either. God's love is specifically designed to, and I'm talking about now her personal love. So when I refer to divine love, I'm actually referring to God's personal desire and love for you as an individual that God has specifically there just for you, no one else. Just for you. When I say no one else, it's a unique thing for you that God has ready for, to give you. Right? 
And God desires this personal relationship and this divine love is the personal relationship that will start to be established between the two of you, if you allow it. And that's totally different than the general love that God has for all of her creatures, including animals and creation and the universe. Totally different type of love. It's a very personal love, a per and you think of it as a personal relationship. Right? Stop, AJ. So is it okay to say, my God? Certainly. Because that's all I, about that? Yes, yeah. I say that all the time. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Someone said, you're a God. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And if they feel an emotional yeah, you know, like response to that, then obviously there's an emotional injury that causes them to feel that. Because every one of you will at some stage, if you develop this personal relationship with God, you will feel like she's your God. Right? And that's how you will speak of, of God. My God, very my Father. Very encourage that um, approach at the ones you Certainly, speak. certainly. They refer to being in a relationship with your God. Yes, but, the, but you'll also notice at the Oneness University, and this is something that I don't agree with, is that they encourage you to have your definition of God. Mm. Yeah. Now, now, what I'm trying to encourage you is to have God's definition of God. <laughs> Do you see the difference between that? See, see, the, see remember, remember I've always said that God has divine truth. In other words, God has her truth, which is the absolute truth, right? And God has divine love, right? Which is the, her personal love that she has. Right? That she can express however she wishes. Now, God's divine truth is a very, very important part of your progression. Understanding that, the God's, that divine truth is absolute truth. It's the black and white truth, if you like. Right? And that's why we often call it the light. You know, as a person grows in love, they also grow in light. They go in, grow in brightness. And the reason why is the absolute truth is the pinnacle of brightness, if you like, that's infinite. And that, is, that also is a part of God. That's part of God's nature. So, so if, I'm, if I'm growing, I will need to at some stage start to accept, if I really want to know God, I have to at some stage accept God's definition of herself to me, not my what I want to be God's definition of herself. And remember yesterday, if those that were there, I talked about self-reliance versus God-reliance. Self-reliance is when you want to define God your way. God-reliance is you accepting God's definition of herself. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So it's very important, if you want to progress completely, I mean, I mean infinitely, on the divine part, which is the only form of infinite progression that is available to you because it is God's way, God designed it. So what I'm talking to you is not my ideas, it's God's ideas. You follow me? Now, you can say, well, he just thinks it's God's ideas, but that's fine, you can say that. But my suggestion is try it out and see whether it's not just my ideas, but it's actually God's ideas. It will resonate with you and you will connect with God if it's God's ideas. You follow me? If, 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 you, if you think it's just my ideas and you don't bother trying it, then, then you'll have to try some other way. And I can t say categorically, you try, try to try another way and they will never lead you to the same way that this way that God has taught me and taught millions and billions of other spirits. Right? So, and can teach you if you wish to accept it. God has a personal relationship with you you can accept these truths through that connection, if you try it that way. So it's very important to understand that absolute truth is God's domain. And all we have is relative. If you want to hold on to your relative definition of God, while you know, the oneness blessing says you can do that, right? The oneness university encourages you to do that. I cannot encourage you to do that. The reason why I can't encourage you to do that is because if you hold on to your own definition of God, you're not accepting God's definition of God. And what I would encourage you to do is to learn to accept God's definition of God, rather than your own. Now, I know that's quite confronting. So isn't that just like a, a child learning something to a level that they can cope with at that time? Exactly. And then they progress on? Exactly. So you're, alla you're allowed to, if you want to, hold on to your own definition of God. And God will allow you to keep doing that. But you will never be at one with God doing that. 
Can you understand why that's the case? Mm. Because in the end, to be at one with God, we will have to have accepted emotionally in our soul God's definition of God. How will you know that? Like if I don't even have an idea of a personal God at this point, I mean, just I can relate to the Holy Spirit, the experience of that. Can I, can I say two things to you firstly? You do have a personal relationship with God because you have received divine love. It's just that you don't trust it. So the issue is not that you don't have a, have a connection with God. The issue is that you just don't trust that connection at this point. When you've gone along to these born-again Christian meetings and, received, you've, and felt you know, the emotional flow of that divine love entering you, that is God communicating with you. Right? You don't trust it. And so therefore you don't feel you have a personal connection with God. But I can feel the divine love in you. So I know that you have received divine love. So therefore you have some connection with God. Right? You're just judging yourself a lot. And you're judging yourself as being inadequate of receiving that love. Does that make sense? And if you keep doing that, of course at some point it's going to stop if you keep judging yourself. If you can just release that judgment of yourself because it comes from your childhood what will actually occur is that you'll receive that divine love consistently in greater doses and then you'll become to know more and more and more truth as a result of it. And that's what I meant in the first century when I said, if you seek first the kingdom or seek first God's love, all of these other things will be added to you. But a lot of times what happens is we have these emotional experiences and we don't trust them. Mm. Right? And that's part of what God is trying to teach you is how to trust yourself and trust your emotions. That's a very important part of what God's trying to teach you. Now, the second part of the question was, can you remember it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for telling me what you just said. Yeah, it's very important to understand that. You, you believe at the moment that you don't have a connection with God, but the truth is quite the opposite. You've already established a connection with God because you've already had that emotional experience. It's just that you don't trust it. Yeah. So she... If she go, has those experiences in church, it's helpful for her to go to church yeah, I'd keep until going. the yeah. connection is so strong that she can have it anywhere. Oh, I have exactly. it at home. Yeah, until yeah. yeah. uh, the connection is just permanent and, and in the end, yeah, just, wow. and you're willing to deal with those emotions. And this is, why, this is why I'm saying don't avoid anything. Don't avoid, like, if you, anything that triggers you emotionally, anything that gets you connected with God emotionally, do it. Right. Right? So, so, you know, if, if, you, if you go to a Catholic church and you sit in front of the altar and that's what connects you, go there and connect you. you know, I'm not saying don't do that. Go there and do that. Right? If the oneness blessing connects you, keep doing that. If anything connects you, keep doing that. See, that to me is more what they were saying. That's exactly yep. what they're saying. Yeah. That's yep. what they're saying. Whatever it takes to connect you with God, that's it. It's not about actually defining it in your own way. It's, it's whatever connects you with God that, that's what works, that's what to do. That's more what they say. Yep. Yes. That's how I understand Bhagavan that. Bhagavan does say, create your own God. Yeah, but, you but know, that's again, a, like again, you said it's, before, taking it out of context. It's taking it out of context, context and taking it literally, because to me, what's... What, what, well, well, I've talked to the spirits who are actually running the oneness movement, yeah. and I can tell you exactly what their feelings about God are. And they, 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 they feel God is a personal God, mm -hmm. right? But they, they feel, they're in, in the sixth sphere and they feel they're at one with God and they are not. But they've used that expression too. The Dasas and Bhagavan talk about God being a personal God. Yes, but they, are, they think they're at one with God and they are not. And that's the difference. <coughs> and I've talked to these spirits and I know like, exactly their emotional reasons why they're not connected with God. You the Dasas are not. No, I'm talking about the spirits who are running the movement in the spirit world. This, every single movement on earth, and this is something for all of you to understand about all religious movements on earth, every single religious movement on earth began in the spirit world. Do you understand that? Absolutely. All of them came from inspiration in the spirit world, from spirits in the spirit world. The oneness movement was begun, begun in the spirit world, in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. Right? And uh, you can speak with the two spirits that are actually running it. They're a soulmate couple. And uh, they, you know, whether they'll speak with you is a different matter. Because they, uh, at times, can be quite haughty at the moment. But they, uh, they, are, they are able to speak with you. They are spirits in the spirit world who have begun the movement. Are they divine love spirits? Or no. Natural love spirits? They're natural love spirits. Yeah. 
Sorry? And there are there are divine love spirits involved in almost every religious form. But the ones who are receiving the channeled information through the earth, most of the time it's, it's happening through the intellect. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I say through the intellect, there's emotions involved, but, but the majority of it is coming through different, different definitions. And, and that is all coming from the spirit world, mostly from natural love spirits. So, so almost every bit of spirituality you receive today, there's a mixture of divine love, and natural love in it, right? And and many of the people even who are involved in giving that information to you don't even know the difference between the two loves, because to a person on earth, the natural love of a six sphere spirit feels like divine love, right? Because if you can re if you can remember that I said in previous things that almost every person on earth when they die passes into the first sphere. These spirits are in the sixth sphere. Now there's, there's five levels of gradations be between those two points in love. Can you imagine what it feels like to feel a six fear spirit's love? Right? Maybe you could describe it a bit for the people who haven't been in that state. And I know it's indescribable, but... Well... Because the state I was, you said the state I was in, in India, was a six fear state. And I tried to describe it and it was impossible. It was, so what long. happened to Grant in India was that he was taken out of body and, and, and in terms of to help you with you know, your pain processing really, taken out of body and given some experiences and perhaps you'd like to describe some of those experiences. These are all six fear spirit experiences. Well for about five hours I was in a state that felt like a full body orgasm that got stronger and stronger and stronger and I just felt at one with the universe and the joy felt infinite <coughs> and I kept looking down at my body to see if it was still there because I felt I was one with everything and it was more love and joy that I've ever felt my whole life and I felt like I was at one with God mm. so I wasn't receiving divine love at that point I was no that, that, that whole experience was given to you by some natural love spirits demonstrating to you the power of their love right and that's a six fear state and, but they view themselves as God do you understand that? Every six fear spirit almost views themselves as God. It's because the, the way their intellectual reasoning is, I am God, you are God. Everyone's God. Everyone's God being expressed. It's very much conversations with God type thinking, if any of you read that. In the conversations with God, the viewpoint is that God split herself up into many to experience herself. Right? That's not the actual truth of God. But it's of what many spirits in the sixth sphere believe. We've been taught that we're all uh, a part of God and that we don't have to become one with God. All we have to do is awaken to God. And yes. it's in all the spiritual literature. You've been taught that you're already at one with God, you just don't remember. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm saying that's not the case. God doesn't make you at one with God without your free will being involved. So why don't people have, especially in, in that environment in the oneness university, yep. have very similar levels of experiences? Is it purely because of their emotional uh, blockages? People are on different levels, so they probably experience it very differently, just as you yeah. divine love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Very much to do with the emotional blockages. Yeah. If I've got an emotional blockage to going out of body, mm. then you won't have an experience oh, like okay. France had. Yeah. And an emotional blockage to going out of body might be a fear of disconnection with yourself. Like, so you're, you're afraid of anything spiritual, and, and most people on earth are afraid of, of that. And so for the majority of people on earth, they don't have that experience, and it's only after years and years of spiritual development that they feel comfortable enough to have that experience. And when they do, a six-fear spirit or, or a spirit of higher development uh, on the natural love path can assist you to have that experience. Yeah. And the spirits in the divine love path can do that as well, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, of course, all the spirits on the divine love path can do that. Yeah. It's just that they will not usually do it, yes. because their their focus is your emotional development and you doing it for yourself. Mm. Right? So there's a completely different focus on the divine love path than there is on the natural love path. On the natural love path, you'll have lots of people helping you metaphysically. Do you understand what I mean by that? So, in other words, they will help you have metaphysical experiences in order for you to feel more confident with your spiritual development. 
on the divine love path, the spirits who are assisting you will have, will have a more emotional focus. They will be constantly helping you to deal with your emotions so that you can actually trigger your own experiences. So they, have a, so it's far, they are far more concerned about you exercising your free will rather than being assisted, if that makes sense. Now, most people on earth want assistance, right? They don't want to have to do it themselves because of an emotional injury, right? The emotional injury is I'm not good enough to do it myself. You know, I, I need help and assistance. I need someone to give me the leg up or whatever. And because of those emotions, we are constantly looking for help from spirits who will help us even though they're not helping our emotions. Right? And because of that, we attract natural love spirits. Divine love spirits are always going to focus on your emotions. Always. And they're going to focus on you being real at any point in your development. So, let's, does everyone understand, though, firstly, this link between God and yourself? It's very important. And we'll use that then as a basis for what's going on, actually, with the one's blessing. Um, with finding out who God really is, to, for me, yeah. is that just a process that will... She will, reveal. she will reveal herself to you through her love. So as her love enters your soul, you will have a series of realizations of truth about God that you didn't have before. Where before you had some very uh, hazy viewpoints of God, and you will start feeling defi very definite feelings about God's personality and God's attributes and God's qualities. And those, that comes to you through the love. So in other words, it enters you emotionally. So you will be able to get to a point within your own development where you know for certain one of God's qualities is one of mercy because you have personally experienced her mercy. You follow me? As an emotion. You've experienced it emotionally. And so you know for certain at that point, now God has told me that part of her attributes is mercy. And I've experienced it, so I know that for certain. It's not some hazy intellectual idea for me anymore. It's actually now an emotional truth that exists within my soul. Mm -hmm. And that's how God tells you her truth. And that's what I meant by all these other things will be added to you, is that as the divine love flows into you and expands your soul, it then expands your soul's capacity to accept all of these truths that you weren't before able to accept because of emotional injuries, or because of a lack of desire for truth. You get to a point on the eighth sphere where you have no more emotional injuries. But that doesn't mean you automatically accept new truths. God only gives you new truths when you desire them in, from your heart. Mm. Right? I still don't have clarity here between the divine path and the natural path in terms of being super bad intensely desire to know God, you know, and really open themselves to that and have an experience, but then you tell me that they're just coming to the sixth dimension. So I don't understand the difference of how you think. When we talk to when I talk to the natural love spirits who are running the oneness movement, they are very, very focused on intellectually reasoning with me about God. And when a person is intellectually focused on reasoning with you about God, they haven't experienced God completely. And they can't experience God's complete, God completely until they have the complete emotional experience. Now, um, did any of you watch the second set of DVDs, uh, the second day's DVDs before you came? Yeah. The channeling of Lucinda? Yeah. Do you remember the, her, in the channeling of Lucinda what she actually said? Remember she said that she was in the sixth sphere in a natural love state she believed herself to be connected with God completely. She believed herself to be at one with God. But then, after visiting the earth and talking with us and, 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 and feeling there might be something more within her soul, she felt a twinge, she said, of dissatisfaction emotionally within her soul. And after responding to that twinge, she actually visited us and talked with us. And then she tried some other things out and she went back to the third sphere in her development and started opening up and being truthful emotionally. Remember she said she had to become real emotionally. And when she did that, when she became completely real and let go of all of her definitions of God and let go of all of her definitions of herself, she began to experience God emotionally. And then she progressed beyond the sixth sphere into the seventh sphere and then up to a one And when she talked on that DVD, she was in the ninth sphere or tenth sphere or something, she said. Now, she believed herself to be at one with God. 
And she said all the words to herself that she was at one with God. But she never had the emotional experience of being at one with God. And this is where all of you are going to find it difficult listening to people. When a person has the emotional experience of being one with God, they are very different than the person who is intellectually thinking they've had the emotional experience of being at one with God. The persons that will talk to you who, have, who, who think they know what at one with means will be very intellectual in all of their interrelationship with you. You will feel their intellect more than you'll feel their passion. You will feel their intellect more than you'll feel their desire. You will feel their intellect more than you feel their emotions. When they have received some divine love, you will feel them differently. And many people on earth have received divine love and don't know it. Many people on earth who have been a part of all different movements on earth, which are all natural love movements, because they all began in the sixth year, they have received some divine love because in their heart they have this connection desire with God. This is what I'm saying, it's an individual thing. So I can't say, well, when you receive divine love, you will know in your heart when another person has. You'll feel it from them, that they have, because they reflect it at you. When I say they reflect it, the quality of their love changes. It's modified by the divine. And that's why I said in the first century, let your light shine before men. The light which is the divine love entering the soul, changes the soul and its characteristics and attributes so much that in the end, you end up relating with people totally differently. Every relationship with a person is emotional. Right? It's not intellectual. So, so even now, like right now, I'm absorbing all of your emotions and feeling, feeling them. Right? And some of you are absorbing some of my emotions and feeling it. Right? Can I ask you here... Like, being in the presence of Ananda Giri, I feel this, I feel full of love, and I feel that love from him is reflected, therefore really opening me up mm -hmm. to love. Yep. And that's the same being in the presence of Bhagavan and mm -hmm. Alma. Even before even going to Alma, on the way, I could really feel my whole being mm -hmm. opening up, mm -hmm. and, and being in your presence is just such a such an experience you cannot put in words, but being in, in your presence, I don't have that same experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so why is that? Well, I mean, I know I feel very triggered by what you're saying, mm -hmm. but... Can, can you feel your emotions inside of when I'm talking? Because it, it's the emotional blockages inside of yourself that are preventing any, any of my love from entering you. Whereas when you're with, love, sorry, love. any of my love, yeah, not God's. So I can't, love. I can't give you God's love. Remember, I said no, that. I, know, yeah. I can't give you God's love. I can only reflect the love that I have inside of me to you. Right? Now, what what all of those all of those gurus that you've mentioned are doing are reflecting the spirit a spirit's love to you, a six sphere spirit's love, and you are open to it emotionally. You are letting yourself feel that emotionally. Because you accept that truth. You accept that what they're saying to you is truth. Whereas what I'm saying to you, you don't accept as truth. So therefore you're not going to be open to the emotional experience. But already this morning we've had two ladies that have been open to that emotional experience. Does that make sense? So, so it's okay, I'm not condemning you or anything. I'm just saying what's actually going on and why the blockage is there. Yeah. And the key is to understand what's going on emotionally. What's happening emotionally is that there are some very, very strong emotions within you that you can feel if you enter, enter into any emotional transaction with me will be exposed within yourself. And you resist that. You don't want those emotions to be exposed within yourself. All you want at the moment is a feeling of love, but you don't want the emotions of responsibility, that, of, the, of the underlying emotions inside of yourself. That's that's what I'm saying to you. So at the moment, here's your soul, right? You're, you're fully desiring love. So you want the expected feeling of love. But inside of your soul, there are feelings opposite to love. Inside of yourself. Injuries based from childhood experiences. Inside of yourself. And at the moment, you are choosing to not experience any of those. All you want is this feeling of love. This feeling of love. This feeling of love. 
but not experience these other terrible feelings inside. So you, at the moment, selectively choosing what you want to experience. And so what's happening is you become very, very focused on experiencing the love, but inside of your soul you're not allowing yourself to experience all of your own emotion. And what that's going to do is prevent you from experiencing God's love. The love you'll be receiving will be from a spirit or from a person on earth who has more love than yourself. But it won't be God's love. The reason why is because God wants you to open up your soul completely to her without any reserve and without any suppression of your own emotion. If that makes sense. And if, if you can do that, if you can open up yourself to God without any reserve and without any, without full, uh, with full expression of your own emotion, then when you long for a lot divine love, you will receive it and it will be a very emotional experience. It won't be just an intellectual recognition of love being radiated to you. You will be crying your eyes out as you're receiving it. Who's experienced that? Yeah, if you've experienced that? When you're receiving divine love, it is so intense that you will not be able to have any intellectual response. It will just be a completely emotional response. Adrian? So is that what I've received before? Many of you here have received divine love. And there's been like moments where you've actually exercised that pure desire in your heart to connect with God and, and actually got allowed the emotional expression completely and just connected with that and away you've gone. So what's blocking me now from that? The, the disallowance of dealing with deeper emotions within yourself. In other words, dealing with untruths that you believe are true inside of you emotionally. Right? When you allow all of it to occur constantly, you will receive divine love constantly. Remember in the channeling with Lucinda, she said at the beginning, in the third sphere, it was hit and miss sort of thing. She received some and then she realised that it stopped and she asked somebody and they said, oh, well, you haven't accepted this truth or that truth. And then she accepted that truth emotionally and then she received some more and so forth. Remember she described that. And then she said once she hit the one with God, what happened is she, she was constantly in that state, constantly emotional, constantly in that state without any reserve. So the only thing that causes the divine love to ebb and flow in us is our own emotional resistance. And it's important to understand that every single one of us, because of the childhood injuries that we receive, often have some very deep emotional resistance to receiving love from anyone, in fact, but in particular from God, because that is the most powerful reception of love that you can ever have. And of course, if you're resistive to receiving love, many of us have this feeling that uh, I only want to receive that much love because that much love is going to overwhelm me. Right? And we have a lot of feelings of unworthiness associated with love. And God, when you connect with God, all of those emotions will be triggered. And so receiving divine love is going to be a completely emotional experience. Now, many people who have gone to the Oneness University have received divine love because they have allowed that complete emotional experience in, that, in, in, in going there have allowed that experience. Many have not, because all they've done is intellectually wanted or desired this love from the people who were there, and, and the love from the spirits who are guiding those people who are there, but are unwilling to completely deal with all the emotional truth inside of the soul. Yeah. So perhaps if I can just describe what's happening with the oneness blessing, and then we'll talk more about sort of the resistances and what you will encounter even in your own giving of the blessing to others, right? <laughs> Hopefully none of your girls have got that shape. Okay. No time. There's nothing on the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to change my stick figure diagrams. <laughs> if I get to be a real artist, Luke, uh, one of the 14, is a real artist and he can just draw things so quickly. So I'll have to get him to do all my diagrams. <laughs> Here's the person on earth. Remember that the person on earth is connected to a spirit form, which is your own spirit form. So this is the spirit body. This is the material body of the person on earth. And then the real you, which is the, which is the soul, the half of you, remember it. 
is the, the soul splits into two at the incarnation. So this is the half, or the female in this case, half of the soul. So that's you. Remember I said that it's only the soul that can connect with God. It's only this soul. Not the bodies. <coughs> the bodies have nothing to do with this connection with God. The soul is what is the real you. That's the real you. The physical form, just an appendage. The spirit body is just an appendage <coughs> of the real you, the soul. And it's the soul connection with God that we're discussing. <coughs> now, there are spirits in the spirit world, so let's just draw a few layers of the spirit world. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's a soulmate couple in the spirit world who are the leaders of the divine of the uh, oneness blessing movement. Each uh, one part of one half of them, the male half, is connected to the male avatar on earth. So they have a connection. Uh, it's a medium, mediumistic connection between that spirit and the person here on earth. Bhagavan. Bhagavan. Yeah. Alright. So just draw him here on earth. And this spirit here is connected with me. Right. And what's her name? Oh. And she is connected. And all of their inspiration and direction are being received from these spirits. And all of the help and the law of attraction that these spirit that they are receiving is all based around the spirits in the spirit world heavily influencing everything around them to make everything work properly. These spirits have a have a desire for God, um, but it's an intellectual. It's intellectual in nature. But they have been perfected in natural love, so they are naturally. So natural love perfect. In other words, they have perfected the love that they can reflect to any single person in the spirit world or here on earth. This condition, by the way, has, has only ever once been experienced on the earth, a six-sphere condition. And that was when Ammon and Aman, the first human couple, were, were actually uh, created in that condition. So it's a very high spiritual condition in natural love. Now remember in the discussion of the introductions, I talked about the qualities of natural love versus the qualities of divine love. Remember I said the qualities of natural love are very much self-reliant. You talk about yourself becoming God, you know, or being God. Right? You talk about um, there's also this heavy con um, focus on um, moral development, you know, doing everything morally correct. In terms of what, and it is also holding on to you, your own definition of God. In fact, when you think about it, you actually are saying that you're a God because you're saying you're a part of God. Right? In other words, you're saying that actually you are God expressed in a different form. And many people on the natural love path believe that implicitly. Right? On the divine love path, you will say you're God's child. You will understand the relationship between you and God as God being your parent rather, or your creator rather than you being God yourself. You are an expression of God in that you are an expression of God's desire. But you don't have a divine spark in you until you long for it. You have a natural love spark within you which can be developed to perfection. And that's the highest potential of your soul. That's the highest potential of your soul without... God's yes. love entering your soul. Mm. Yep. It was put there by God as a potential. That's right. God, God put this potential and inbuilt this potential into all human souls. That, that the highest possible potential you can grow to without God involved in your life. And when I say without God, I'm not talking about God intellectually involved in your life. I'm talking about God being emotionally involved in your life. Totally different things. All right? If you want to progress on the natural, on the divine love path, what will happen is that you will have to be, you'll get to a point in the seventh sphere where you will lose all intellectual connections, including the intellectual connection you have with God, and you will have a totally emotional connection with God. Right? 
by the time you made the transition of the new birth. Now what's actually happening is these spirits influencing these people and in fact all of the love that these people have is very much, there's huge there's spirits of a large number of spirits and by the way this is not the, they are not the only human couple on earth that are experiencing this. You've all heard of John of God and yes. different people like that. They are all experiencing the same experience where there are large groups of spirits in the six sphere condition projecting their love through the ectoplasm of the person on earth to other people. You follow me? There are whole groups of spirits in the spirit world doing this. You also see it happening in a negative sense. You've all heard of spirit possession of evil spirits. Well, many evil spirits band together in the same way, thousands or even tens of thousands of them, and actually project the same kind of energy to people on earth. They wouldn't come from the sixth sphere. No, they come from the hells of the first sphere, or the lower regions of the first sphere. So this happens not only in the sixth sphere, but all spheres in between. Right? So it's a natural, it's a thing that all people generally in the spirit world have worked out they can do. Now, the, the intentions of these spirits in doing this are pure in the sense that they are pure as to what they understand God to be. So their intention is pure to help as many people here on the earth as possible to grow spiritually so there's less pain on the earth. That's their intention. Right? So I'm not saying they have a negative intention at all. They have a positive intention for the earth. And in fact, in the sixth fear state, that's all you have. You are perfected in natural love, so you have a positive intention with every single person you meet. Right? Including any person on earth. Right? They are Sorry. Go on. That's why there's been such a positive response from the oneness movement on the planet generally. Yes. Yeah. All that energy coming through. All this energy, there's 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 tens of thousands of six sphere spirits involved in the oneness movement in the spirit world. Right? And there's there's literally millions of spirits totally in different spheres. So some are in the third sphere, some are in the fourth, some are in the fifth, and many are in the sixth. And there is a, almost a chain of hierarchy, in fact, between these spirits. Right? There's an opportunity then to, to bring a lot of love into the planet. Yeah, and, and, and many of them have a very, very strong desire to do that. Because many of them, when they were on Earth, experienced some terrible atrocities, which they no longer want to see occurring on Earth. So they have a really, really strong desire for this love to flow onto the Earth. And so they have a very strong desire to project as much pot love as they possibly can through individuals on the earth to other individuals, if that makes sense. Just like you can have a positive desire to project your love to people in the same manner. They have a, very, a, a much more intense desire than you would realise at the moment. Because you can only realise what, how intense their desire is if you were actually in that state yourself, if that makes sense. So their, their, their desire is intense to give this love that they have as a part of themselves to others. So what they do is they connect specifically with people that they can have a very, very good mediumistic connection with. And then that love gets reflected via that person to the person who's receiving the blessing. Okay, so it does come through Uma and Bhagavan. Um, well, initially it did. Okay. What happened then is as different people went through the same experiences as the two founders, they then have also got into the condition where six spirit, spirit, six fear spirits can connect with them directly. So you, you've heard of all of the, the ones who went to the seven day course, isn't there the, what are they called? Oneness beings. The oneness beings. Mm -hmm. The oneness beings are actually completely enveloped by a six fear spirit. They are a person on the earth who's been completely enveloped uh, in a mediumistic sense, you could say almost possessed, right? Mm -hmm. In a six fear sense of a spirit in the spirit world and that's why they walk around in this permanent state that a six fear spirit would walk around in. Right? And then they reflect all this love to whomever they meet. Right? And that's, that's going to have a very powerful effect in motion on any person who's receiving that love. Because you, you're now getting in human form a person who's in the six fear really reflecting all of this love to you. Right? And you'll feel it, if you're open to it, if you're open to it emotionally, you will feel it. And it will be a lovely, lovely, beautiful sensation that will enter you. 
Now, the only, there, are, there are, from a divine love perspective, a few issues that are involved with it that, that you just need to consider. One is that if this person is enveloped by a spirit, then this person is now not themselves anymore, but a mixture of themselves and the spirit. In other words, their free will is now not being fully respected. And spirits in the sixth sphere do not need to respect your free will. Because it's only spirits that are on the divine life path who are, and celestial spirits who will fully respect your free will. They don't use their free will way to go into this state. They do. This, per, this person uses their free will, the law of attraction says, this person saying, I want to be this kind of person. And then the spirit connects, bang, you've got that beautiful connection. And then they walk around permanently in that state. But it's not a real state for the person. It's actually the real state of the spirit who's connecting to the person. Does that mean it's, is it inhibiting their soul growth? It's inhibiting their soul growth. Actually, they're moving it out of it. They do, because, they, because no single person on earth generally can maintain a permanent connection in that state. Right? So they'll move in and out of it as they go. But, but um, and so, so even like ones like John of God and ones like that who are doing lots of healing through, with spirit, lots of spirits helping them, can't permanently stay in that state. And, and most of the so-called avatars in India and so forth can't permanently stay in that state either. Because there's so much energy passing through them that to stay in that state permanently would actually physically harm them. So they have to actually step out of that state, you know, and then, then the spirits themselves actually heal the body of the person. So the, so the body's healed enough for them to step back into that state, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, so that's a permanent thing that goes on constantly. So why don't, why don't the six of the spirits materialise on Earth rather than taking over a body? And because a lot of, for a lot of people on Earth, that would create a lot of fear. But they wouldn't necessarily know, would they? Um, yeah, well, it depends on how many did it at the same time. The other thing is that there are some laws, actually, of God, divine love laws, that actually prevent spirits from materialising under certain circumstances. And one of the circumstances that prevents a spirit from materialising is the circumstance where the spirit is teaching spiritual truth. So a spirit is allowed to materialise in order to assist you physically and a spirit is allowed to materialise in order to assist you emotionally. A spirit is allowed to materialise in order to help you uh, work through different issues of your own life um, in terms of you know, saving your life. But a spirit is not allowed to materialise if, if they are teaching spiritual truths. That's currently the case. That's currently the law. It's not going to be the law in the future, but that's God's direction at the moment. That's what God wants at the moment. Is that because God wants each one of us to experience those truths from God? Totally. Totally. God wants the personal relationship with the individual. That's what God wants. God doesn't want anything else. God wants the personal relationship with you. And that's why God prevents these... Because if, if all of the people in the sixth sphere... There's literally thousands of religions in the sixth sphere. So in the sixth sphere, the Buddha is in the sixth sphere. He's still in the sixth sphere. He actually believes himself to be at one with the universe and has almost completely lost his own personality in the process. He doesn't even view himself as Buddha anymore. He just views himself as God. But he's in the sixth sphere. Right? So, having the divine love, being on the divine love path now, that will stop us from falling into that trap when we're up there? And what happens with divine love progression is quite often what we're doing is stepping on the path, stepping off the path, stepping on the path, <laughs> because, because what we're doing is we're avoiding our emotions, not avoiding our emotions, <laughs> avoiding our emotions, right? And, and it's only when you get to alignment with God that, that you will actually no longer be avoiding all of your emotions and therefore never stagnate on the divine love path. So there are times when we receive divine love, but we're now stagnant on that path. So for example, um, if I can give you some examples of that, a born-again Christian believes heavily that, the blood, that Jesus' blood say, has saved them. So they've had, a, they've had an emotional experience where they've cried their eyes out receiving divine love, and they believe that the reason why they had that experience is because my blood saved them. 
and they were now saved. They treat themselves as saved. Now what actually happened was they had a pure desire in that instant to receive divine love and they received it. But they've now misinterpreted the reason why. And this is why many born again Christians don't continuously have that experience because they now believe themselves to be saved and they don't seek for any more love. Huh? So what actually happens then is they, they stagnate in the belief and so you can choose to stagnate in the belief even when you've received divine love. Because remember, the reception of divine love is totally dependent on free will. And you can exercise your free will to deny your own emotions at any point and deny any truth at any time. And when you do that, you will stagnate in divine love. So I know people who, and talk to people who stayed in the seventh sphere of their spirit progression, so they've received divine love, divine love to be above the sixth sphere, in the seventh sphere, and yet they've been in the seventh sphere for a hundred years. Do you know which sphere you're in when you're there? Like, do you know that, like... In the spirit world, yes. You, it's very, very obvious in the spirit world where you're at. Is there a big number when you enter? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and also, um, it depends whether you're on the natural love and divine love path too. When you're on the divine love path, remember I've said to you that all these other things will be added to you. And what all these other things are, are a knowledge of how the universe actually works. And a knowledge of all the dimensional existences, which are all the spheres in the spirit world. And why certain spheres have certain feelings in them. So, for instance, in every odd number sphere, the second sphere, the fourth sphere, and the sixth sphere, many spirits on the divine love's path don't stay there very long. And the reason why is because the, spirit, the other spirits that are in that sphere are very, very intellectual in their development. So it's a bit like, let's say, half of you were very emotional and half of you were very intellectual. Now, when you sit down and have a cup of tea with each other, what, how do you find your conversations? <laughs> Like, the ones who are emotional annoy the ones that are intellectual, and the ones that are intellectual annoy the ones that are emotional, do they not? Yeah. And the reason why that is, is because when you become emotional, you feel that everything intellectual is pointless anymore. Yeah. Right? And so the spirits on the divine love path often do not spend very much time in the even-numbered spheres of the spirit world. Now, the same applies within yourself here on earth. You will feel shifts, major shifts as you're receiving divine love. And you will know that, wow, I've just had a major shift. And one of the major shifts that occurs, say, the transition between the second and the third sphere, is the shift into truth. When you shift into fully acknowledging, fully choosing your own emotional truth, you will make a shift into the sec from the second to the third sphere, if you're on the divine love path with God. So, when you make the shift into God-reliance, you will make the shift into the third sphere. And you'll feel these shifts occur inside of you, but you won't realise you're in the third sphere because that doesn't make any sense to you at this point. But you'll feel the major shift that occurred with those two realisations. Right? So you will know that you're progressing. And, you will, and everyone around you will feel that you are. Right? But you won't necessarily know where you're at until you're at one with God. When you're at one with God, you will know exactly where you're at. Because when you're at one with God, you have a permanent knowledge... I'm, and I'm talk, talking here, I'm talking a permanent feeling that you're now immortal. In other words, that nobody can kill you, nobody can harm you in any way. But isn't that how the um, natural love path spirits feel? No. In the sixth sphere? No, there's constant discussion in the sixth sphere about their immortality. There's a difference between immortality and everlasting. Immortality means that nobody can kill you, even God. Everlasting means that who knows what might, might happen. At the moment, I just believe I live eternally. Right? Now, in the, seventh, in the sixth sphere, there's literally th like hundreds of thousands of spirits constantly discussing these issues of immortality. When, when you become at one with God, you are now fully conscious of your own immortality. You will never, ever be able to die, ever. No matter what happens. Because to kill you, God would have to kill her own love, if that makes sense, as if God would kill anything. But if for you to die, it means that God would die. So, of course, you're now immortal. Now, a six-fear spirit is not conscious emotionally of their immortality. They think they're immortal, but they don't feel it. 
And so quite often, and there's spirit, six weird spirits here listening to our conversation, and they're just having a realization actually. Maybe I asked it for them. Yeah, there's, there's some six fear spirits uh, at the moment having a realization that they still have a feeling in their soul that they're not immortal, even though they have an intellectual thought that they are. Mm. Yeah. What's, what's happening with uh, Lao Tzu and Patanjali? What sphere are they? I've got, who, who are they? Well, Lao Tzu, <laughs> Lao Tzu he was like the Taoism guy, and the um, Patanjali was near the yoga, the yoga uh, sutras. Of yeah. Yeah, you both are still in the sixth sphere. Yeah. One's like um, there are others that are not who are on similar who are on similar paths on the earth. Like Gandhi's not. Mm -hmm. uh, Gandhi's in the in the seventeenth sphere. Um, mm -hmm. What about Yogi Yanda, who talks a lot about you through his teachings of Christ consciousness? Yeah, he's in the sixth sphere. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about like I met? I met this man, John De Reuter, he's a Canadian teacher. Yeah, I, would pref yeah I, I prefer not to say much about who people are who are alive still and where they are. There's no one on earth, there's no one on earth in a soul condition, and so even, is Yogi Anna still alive? I think he's no, 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 no. passed. Paramhansa Yogi who, who, who channels Yogi Anna now? There's somebody who does in, this, in India. Um, yeah, but anyway. What, happen, what often happens when a spirit of good develop, when a person of good development passes on the natural love path, is they connect with another person on earth who's of good development, right at chi or, or at a child, and then develop them. And the Dalai Lamas are all a succession of connection with six spirits. And many of the Dalai Lamas are on the divine path now. So many of the Dalai Lamas in the spirit world are are one with God. But, but there are still some in the six fear condition in the spirit world who, what they do is they choose the next Dalai Lama as a child on earth, then they, then they heavily influence him with their love and with all their guidance uh, because of the child's ability to channel that information to their own soul. And then what they do is they step away from that child when that child becomes an adult. So the, so the, so the grown Dalai Lama is a reflection of his own love then. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then when that, that Dalai Lama passes, they choose another. Mm -hmm. And that, that has happened cyclically over generations. So it's not actually the same soul coming back at no. all? No. As they think? No. No. It's, a, it's, it, it's the same souls who have passed, who are mm -hmm. constantly... Mm -hmm. So all of the information from those souls that they've picked up through their lifetimes are all fed to the new child. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. it appear like it's the reincarnated soul. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and that happens, that happens in many faiths, not just in, in Eastern faiths, but it happens a lot in Eastern faiths because of their heavy spirit connection. See, a lot of Western faiths, like Christian faiths, don't like the idea of talking with a spirit, and don't like the idea of channeling a spirit, and don't like the idea of out-of-body experiences or any of those kind of things. And so there is a lot of resistance to... to uh, people channeling things in Western face. But in Eastern face, there is very little resistance at all to channeling information from spirits. But they do have their own version of it, like speaking in tongues and Certainly. spirit healing. And prophesying and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff, yes. And a lot of that wild dancing they do, you know, yeah. that's all Where that, yeah. opening to spirit. And a lot of times they're connecting with spirits in very low condition, by the way, too. Ah. So, you know, if a person makes you fall around and flap around on the ground, <laughs> Do you think he's a person who's really being nice to you? Like, <laughs> honestly, no. do you feel that? Like, no. so obviously that spirit that is connecting with that person isn't is in as good development as what the person maybe is considering. What are you actually saying? Because I've actually been involved in the Pentecostal church yep. myself, and yep. I've even spoken in tongues. And yep. Um, what they actually say with somebody falling on the ground is that it's the actual other uh, demons coming out of one. Oh, so I realise that. Yeah. I'm sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not. No. Often it's the spirit influencing the person yeah. rather than coming out of the person. Yeah. And, and so the key, the key is to uh, allow... If you, look at, if you look at all the times in the Bible that's been recorded that, that I expel demons, the person started in a crazed condition and ended in a normal condition. Oh. Not the opposite way around. Mm. <laughs> right? 
So, so if you look at all forms of spirit possession and, and, ex, and expulsion, when the spirit is expo expelled, the person should be acting in a much more calm and reasonable manner, not the opposite way around. And if they don't have a shirt,